Improvements. What is an improvement? Think back. An improvement is what is any man-made item or addition to a property. Now, I will tell you right here, right here is where we start to see the first divergence between residential and commercial real estate. Okay, because this, when we start getting into trade fixtures and we start getting into commercial leases, they are completely or significantly different than perhaps the residential lease. And typically, neither party is required to make improvements. Now, I'm saying an improvement. Remember, an improvement's an addition. If something breaks, then yes, there may be a requirement to fix that. That is not what we are talking about here. If the tenant says, oh, I'd like a driveway widened so I can put my other car there, that is not going to be required of the lessor to do that. But if the HVAC breaks, that may be a different story. That is not an improvement. That is a fixing of an improvement that was already in place. <clears throat> Tenants may make improvements. Landlords may get, give the tenant the permission to say, oh, I've got a dog. You allowed the dog in our lease. We would like to put a fence around the backyard. And the landlord says, okay, go ahead, but you're going to do it at your cost and your labor, and I'm giving you permission. And the tenant says, okay, we'll put the fence up. Anything that might be a trade fixture, this is in that commercial world where there's a deli cabinets or a pizza oven or bookshelves. Those, once again, are going to be at the permission or the uh, agreement between the landlord and the tenant. Here's what I was just talking about is that tenants may make reasonable modifications, but they have to restore the property in the original case. So if the person in a wheelchair says, I will put up the ramp so that I can get in the house and you okay that improvement, they then have to put take that ramp out when they leave or they are in violation of the lease. This is why, back to that security deposit, there could be a second one because that ramp is a cost above what a normal security deposit was in place to do, okay? Here again, we start getting into the difference between commercial and residential. Um, we start getting into the maintenance of things. And depending on what maintenance is, depends on what the landlord's liable for. Because things like changing light bulbs could be considered maintenance. Well, changing the air filter in the furnace, those are things that may be under the tenant's responsibility. If it's something that is required to maintain the property, in what's called habitable condition, then yes, most jurisdictions require the landlord. So exactly what I was just saying, if the HVAC heater goes out, that is something that would be construed as making the property hab habitable. Hey, I can't live in a house with no furnace and it's January here in Minnesota. That requirement is going to be a landlord's thing. The tenant can is supposed to return the property in the same condition, less this thing that courts call wear and tear, like carpets is the best example. You buy a brand new carpet, tenant moves in, they live there a year. When they move out, those carpets are not expected to be brand new because there is just normal wear and tear. But there is expected to be no holes in the wall from you know, altercations between the tenants that lived in there. There's expected to have the windows in place and they broke glass on the way out. So they must return the property in the original condition 
that it was in. If the property gets destroyed, there's a difference. If the tenant is the one that put that improvement on, like an outbuilding, and that property would get destroyed, that was not part of the original lease, so the tenant is still going to be liable for the rent, okay? If the property gets destroyed, that's not part of the tenant's fault. Typically, the lease is adjusted, and it can be adjusted in several different ways. I had a investor who is actually now a real estate agent, uh, investor years ago, when I was her actual agent before she got her license, had a property down in the city of Indianapolis. And while the family was gone to work, there was a huge storm. It blew a tree over and it actually clipped the corner of the house. Uh, thank God nobody was in the house at the time, but it virtually destroyed that bedroom and had to get adjusted uh, and had to get fixed. But, you know, you had to go through the process of the insurance adjuster and all that. So it took a couple months. In that particular case, that house went from a four bedroom to a three bedroom. There could be an adjustment of 25% of the rent. That's one fourth of the bedrooms. That's one way to adjust the rent. Brooke could have said, hey, it was 200 square feet of the 2000 square feet. You still have access to 90%. So we'll reduce the rent by 10%. So you can adjust it any way that seems logical, okay? Now, when it comes to the transfer of leases, there are two different ways to do this. There is an assignment of a lease and there is a transfer or a assumption of a lease. So let's go over here and look at this. Let's say here's the landlord and he leases to tenant number one. This would be called a lease. And this is what we are discussing. If tenant one defaults on the lease, the landlord has a contractual obligation or a contractual uh, requirement that he can sue tenant one for damages. Now, let's say that tenant one subleases to tenant two. A sublease is a lease from another lessor to lessor number two. That is a sublease here. There is a second version called an assignment. And you should have heard this word once before. Now, in the assignment... Tenant two is taking on the responsibilities of tenant one. <clears throat> In a sublease, tenant two is merely leasing from tenant one. You see a sublease more common in the commercial world. For example, tenant one is leasing all 30,000 square feet of the warehouse. And then tenant one's business slows down a little bit. So what they do is they go out and they find a tenant that may only need 10,000 square feet. So what they do is they lease some of their 30,000 to tenant two and tenant two moves into that 10,000 square feet of the 30. This would be a sublease. Now, the problem with this is if tenant two does not pay his rent because it's a lease of tenant one who is on the original lease, tenant one is still liable for the full amount of the 30,000 square feet. The landlord cannot sue tenant two, because if you see this process right here, there is no lease between tenant 
to and the landlord. There is no contract. So if the landlord tried to sue tenant two, the first thing the judge is going to say is, <clears throat> let me see the lease so I can read it. And tenant two is like, your honor, I don't have a lease with the landlord. So the landlord does not have a dog in the hunt in this case. He would have to sue tenant one because that's where the original lease says. So that is called a sublease. Now, in the example of an assignment, because tenant two has taken on the rights and responsibilities of tenant one, now tenant two does not pay the rent. The landlord does have a chain, so to speak, of the original lease and the assignment to two. Now the landlord could, in essence, sue tenant two through this combination of these two that connect them together. In this, this other one over, over here, there is no connection, so he can't sue. In an assignment, he could sue. So there are ways to a sublease and assign. Most tenants or most landlords actually prohibit either one of these. They don't want to get into this convoluted, who do I sue? Who do I have to have an assignment of? But if you remember, an assignment is a transfer of the tenant's interest, the rights and the responsibilities, where the sublease is a tenant of a tenant. And to do either one of those requires the original lessor, i.e. the landlord's consent. So those basically are two other ways, but typically most leases say you cannot sublease or you cannot assign this lease. If something happens and tenant one needs to go away, typically what happens is the landlord would terminate the lease with tenant one now, I'm not saying that there could be a court action to make sure that tenant one pays for damages, which would un include unpaid rent. And then the landlord would just strike a new lease entirely with tenant two. So that's typically what happens rather than trying to go through this subleasing or an assignment. Now, there are reasons that those may be valid. So don't say that it never happens. It could, uh, and there are some reasons to do that. If the landlord has tenant one on a really good rental rate, mean it's higher than market, he may want tenant two to get it assigned because the rental rate stays high. Whereas if he had to strike a new deal or a new lease, the rental rate may go down because the market has softened. So there are some reasons actually allow it an assignment leases get recorded now why would a lease get recorded most states have a law that says if a lease is longer than three years it must be recorded now understand what i'm saying here is if the lease itself is three years what i am not saying is if you have a one-year lease and you renew it three times that is not a three-year lease that is a one-year lease that got renewed. What I'm talking about here is the actual start date and the end date are three years or more apart. So it's in a state for years that maybe is a five-year lease. Very common in commercial world, okay? My leases, and I told you I've got several leases in other strip centers, where it was actually a five-year lease, all right? It must be recorded. And the reason why, and I'll tell you what I'll do, I'll give you a star for the day if you can tell me why you think it needs to be recorded. So push the pause button, take a couple minutes and come back, and let's see if you can get why that lease should be recorded. Okay, we're back. The reason that that should get recorded is because remember there is a clause probably well, there's a clause in the mortgage and the landlord may have a mortgage on this property and that clause says 
It's called the alienation clause, if you remember, where it says if the landlord or the owner of the property has lost control of the asset, that loan would be called due. So the mortgage company is going to look at this property and go, dude, that guy's been in there like four years. You sold that. We're going to activate the alienation clause. And the landlord says, time out. I didn't sell it. It's a tenant. And the mortgage company is going to go, really? Can you prove that? Why, yes, I can. Because I recorded the lease that shows the start date and the end dates five years later. So they are technically under a lease. I did not lose control of the asset. I am leasing it out. So this recording helps protect the actual lessor, who in this example is also the mortgagor from the lender to buy that rental property. That's why they do it. If, well, let's say when, there is a clause called the non-disturbance clause. I will tell you right now, I have never seen a non-disturbance clause in any residential mortgage. So unless you are dealing with non-owner occupied loans, i.e. investor loans or commercial loans, you probably will never experience this clause. But what this clause says is that if the mortgagor, which is the landlord, right? We got to be thinking two ways here. They're the mortgagor with the bank, <clears throat> but they're the lessor to the tenant. If the mortgagor gets in financial issues or a financial bind with his lender and the lender files for foreclosure, the lender agrees to not bother the tenant. Don't disturb the tenant. It's not the tenant's fault that the land, landlord is in financial issue. And like I said, this is mainly in your big commercial loans. I have seen many cases of this where the owner got into trouble. And in this example, it was a big name grocery store that said, look, dude, we've got millions of dollars in this grocery store. We've got millions of dollars in ads and TV commercials and radio. We can't get kicked out of this today. So the, the grocery store actually started paying their monthly rent directly to the lender and bypassed the landlord or the mortgagor in this particular example. And the bank said, okay, we will foreclose upon the owner, but we will allow you to stay until your lease is expired or until you want to build another grocery store somewhere else and do the move and spend that time. So it's very common for a tenant to have a non-disclosure clause or non-disturbance clause inside of their commercial lease. It is not ever in any residential lease I have ever seen.